Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Great to be here and to see friends here as well. Uh, what a blessing for me to be to be here. Uh, yes, I did hand out those notes. Not not everything I'm going to say is on those notes, but it's a it's a it's a, an, a rough outline for you. Let, let's begin by praying again. Let's pray. Father, we do give thanks and praise for your word. We pray at the end of a long day that you would uh, help us. Uh, give attention to your word. We pray your Holy Spirit would come and help us in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm talking about spiritual gifts. That's been a controversial issue in the life of the church. I have to say a little autobiographical word. I, I grew up as a Roman Catholic. I was converted when I was 17. I was immediately inducted into, I grew up in Salem, Oregon, very nearby here. Um, so uh, I was in, immediately inducted into a conservative Baptist church in, uh, in Salem. And so I started out as a cessationist. That's what I was taught. Over the years, um, I have friendships with, uh, relationships with uh, uh, Don Carson, John Piper. John Piper was my pastor for 11 years. Uh, Wayne Grudem is a very dear friend of mine, if you know that name. Uh, Sam Storms, and they are all continuationists, and so it, maybe in the late 80s and early 90s, I became a continuationist, and then, this does not inspire great confidence in listening to me, does it? <laughs> but then, in the 90s, I, somewhere in the mid-90s, I went back to being a, what I call a nuanced cessationist. I'll explain that as we go. So, of course, evangelicals have been discussing the gifts for over 100 years now. You know, it was since the rise of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, Pentecostals and Charismatics are, are known for their focus on gifts. As, you know, there's people who are all over the place, but some people say, well, we're open to the gifts, but we're cautious. In most of those situations, and churches that say that they're open and cautious, at least in my experience, they're basically, in practice at least, cessationist churches. They say we're open, but they're cautious. I haven't seen many situations where the, church, the gifts are practiced in those, uh, in those situations. Uh, actually, a lot of cessationist churches, they hardly ever talk about the gifts at all. Which, which is interesting as well. But Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I'm reading from my favorite Bible, the CSB, um, the Christian Standard Bible. There's lots of good Bibles out there, but I like the CSB. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. So... This is something we need to understand according to the Word of God. You know, some people say, well, I'm, I'm really tired. It depends on your experience, right? But I'm tired of talking about spiritual gifts. I don't want to talk about something that's controversial. I don't want to hear about this subject anymore. I've heard so much about them. I've argued so long over them. I, I, I don't care about this anymore. But, but Paul says, I, I go back to God's Word. Paul says knowing about the gifts is, is important. And he says we ought not to be ignorant about the gifts. So we're, we're called upon to, to study and to think. It's, it's part of God's revealed word. And we, we want to know. I take it, I mean, you're here. It's a Friday night. You must want to know, you know. You, you are the people, right? Now, uh, if you're here tonight, I'd say. But... Our, our central texts on the spiritual gifts are 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, those three chapters. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Well, we're not going to be able to... We're going to have to go fast. We're not going to cover everything in those passages, right? But I'd like to begin... This talk by, by, by listing, really borrowing from J.I. Packer, I think that is in your notes, the strengths and weaknesses of the charismatic movement. J.I. Packer, well-known 
Anglican theologian who just recently died. This is from his book, Keep in Step with the Spirit, which I think is a very wise and helpful book in every respect. I hope it's still in print. So, so I think Packer's observations help, help us set a context when we're talking about spiritual gifts. So I'm going to hit these quickly, but he talks about strengths and weaknesses, and that's one thing I like about Packer. Packer Packer doesn't only talk about weaknesses but we, and strengths, but, or he doesn't only talk about strengths, but also weaknesses, and I think that's helpful. So here's the strengths, and the charismatic, we could say Pentecostals as well. First, they stress the activity of the Holy Spirit and the need to be filled with the Spirit. Sometimes we, as evangelicals, tend to ignore, at least in practice, the Holy Spirit. And... Charismatics, Pentecostals remind us of the importance of the Spirit. Second, they recognize the importance of emotions in the Christian life and Christian speech and song. Right doctrine is important. It's crucial. But so is our experience with God, right? We, we could stress right thinking. I've been... You know, this is my 40th year teaching. I've been around a lot of really brilliant people. And, and right doctrine and right thinking are important, but, but we, we should not neglect right, the emotions. That God made us as whole people. Third, charismatic stress the importance of a vital prayer life. Now, they're not the only ones that do this, right? But they, they do emphasize prayer. And it's, and it's crucial, it's crucial to Christian, for Christians to be in communion with God. Fourth, they insist on the involvement of every Christian in worship. Worship isn't just led by leaders. It is, it is led by leaders. I mean, that's the function of leaders. But, but charismatic stress every member ministry the body as a whole is at work. Charismatics have emphasized that. They rightly capture and emphasizing that a, a biblical emphasis, and we're thankful for it. Fifth, charismatics have missionary zeal. The most, you, you, you probably know this, the, the Christian faith, I'll say something else on the other side about this, but the Christian faith is advancing throughout the world, most prominently through charismatics. That's quite interesting. They want to see others converted and saved. It's the worldwide, it's really the largest Christian movement today. We're, we're thankful for that. Second, I mean sixth, they emphasize fellowship in small groups and community living. Of course, many churches do that, but the, but the charismatics emphasize that from the beginning. You know, again, seeing that importance of the body, of the, the role of every member. Seventh, there's an emphasis on childlike openness and warmth and spontaneity. There, there's, an, there's an openness to the spirit, right? There's a, there's a, there's a childlike trust. That's, that's a very good thing. Eighth, they, they see the reality of Satan and demons. Some Christians say they believe in Satan, but never think about him. Or demons, right? There's, yeah, there's Satan and demons, but, but charismatics think about the realm of the demonic. And ninth, Christianity is supernatural. Charismatics believe, I hope you believe too, God can still do miracles today. God is still active today. He's not an absent God. So those are, those are remarkable strengths. And I think Packer rightly reminds us of those and we're thankful, right, as we talk about something like this. We remember we're talking about brothers and sisters, maybe some of you even in this room, right, would identify yourself as such. So fundamentally, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, even when we disagree on some matters. But then are there some weaknesses in the charismatic movement? Yes. Uh, the first one, again, I'm, these are all from Packer. Or, or maybe they're not all from Packer. Maybe the last two are me. I can't remember. But mainly from Packer. Um, there's, there's, a, there's elitism. There's elitism sometimes. A spiritual aristocracy and a pride. 
Yeah. Interestingly, that's the same problem we see in 1 Corinthians. Because in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, the, those who were speaking in tongues clearly thought they were spiritually superior. Secondly, there's a sectarianism. Sectarianism. They, they tend to read only charismatic books. So that can be cultic. I mean, any of us can be cultic, right? Southern Baptists can be cultic and only read Southern Baptists. But that, that can be cultic. There, there can be no willingness to learn from other branches of Christendom. That's, that's not good, is it? We need, to be, we need to be open learning truth from wherever truth comes from. Third, and often, not always, but there's an anti-intellectualism which results in naivete and imbalance, sometimes being too simplistic. Sometimes the emphasis on emotions, right, look at the other side, it can denigrate the importance of careful thought. But we can neglect the emotions, but also we need to think carefully. Really, the fourth one's the same thing, really, isn't it? The, the importance of theology could be slighted. Careful interpretation of Scripture often, not always, but is often ignored. Too often, this is really quite interesting, in, in, now in academic circles, and this is true, what I'm saying, in charismatic and Pentecostal circles and academic circles, too often the inerrancy of Scripture is denied by, by, by their, many of their scholars, which is a very concerning and, but, but you combine that with a, a reliance on direct, direct revelations. That's, that's problematic. Which leads to the fifth, claims to revelation which can't be supported. They may claim God is speaking to them and, and there's no openness to correction or questioning of such claims. Somebody who questions it, they may say, you know, I mean... Why aren't you trusting God? You know, God's speaking through me. Sixth, spirituality is measured by the gifts. But 1 Corinthians 13, right, in these, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on 1 Corinthians 13, but it, it's right in the center of that discussion on spiritual gifts for a reason, because the greatest of these is not spiritual gifts. The greatest of these is love, which is a test for all of us, isn't it? Seventh, I love this little thing. This is definitely from Packer. Super supernaturalism. I think that's a nice expression. Always expecting miracles. Never see God. Well, never. That's probably too strong. But too often they don't see God as acting through normal processes. But that's how God ordinarily works, right? Think of the book of Proverbs, right? Most of life is lived in the ordinary and the routine, and God meets us in those moments. We, we do, in other words, we don't live a miracle a minute lives, right? That's not, that's, unless you want to say the work of the Spirit is a miracle every moment. Okay, I agree, but you, I think you know what I'm saying. Eighth, the health, wealth, gospel. Of course, many charismatics don't believe in this, but most charismatics, so here, here, here's a problem, right? It's spreading throughout the world, but, but, there's, but there's significant theological problems as well because most charismatics throughout the world hold to this theology. So they preach a health, wealth, gospel, and, and, and the charismatic movement worldwide is riddled with false teaching, which begin, so you begin to ask how many of those conversions are really conversions, right? So I, God knows at the end of the day, but that's something that needs to be evaluated. That, that's a problem. Ninth, we talked about on the one side, neglecting the satanic, but ninth, demon obsession and territorial spirits, seeing demons everywhere. And, and, and actually, the evidence for territorial spirits, you can ask me a question about that later if you want, but it's quite weak. I, I know of a professor in a seminary, and he, he started his talk in a seminary class. He held up a glass of water, not this glass of water, obviously, 
This is not a glass, actually. That was a, that was a test. Um, but um, he held up a glass of water, and he said, a lot of you students out there have demons in them, and I'm going to cast them into the glass of water. He was dead serious. He was dead serious. But I think that was a very unbiblical thing to do, <laughs> to start his class that way. But he, plus, he didn't even know the students in this class to say something like that. I know another seminary professor who went on a trip to Ephesus. This is a PhD. This guy's written a lot of books. I'm just not saying his name, because I don't want to say his name. But if you ask me, maybe I'll tell you. But he, <laughs> but he, he went on a trip to get Diana of Ephesus, of Diana of the Ephesians off God's throne in Turkey. I'm like, what in the world? Diana is not on God's throne. God's on his throne. What, what are we talking about here? So that's not, that's not, that's not a biblical um, idea. So you, you, have, you, you have people saying, cast out the demon of lust, cast out the demon of anger. But Scripture doesn't talk that way. What does Scripture say? Put away lust. Put away anger. So we have to be careful we're following Scripture instead of just inventing things that seem helpful. Tenth, of course, we all face this in various ways, but, but conformism, group pressure, people feel compelled to have the same spiritual experiences, and so there can be a pressure. When I was a, so I told you I got converted out of Catholicism, and I didn't go to seminary, and I was, I was in a fine church for five years, but I really wasn't very doctrinally formed, and I remember Diane and I in Salem, Oregon, going to a Pentecostal church, and we went up front, and I went up front and prayed to receive the gift of tongues, which was, you know, where I was at that time. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying I think that was a bad thing, but I was, I was also very immature, and nothing was happening, you know? So I walked out of the church really frustrated because I didn't get the gift. But did I have that sense of conformism and expectations? Because I was dating. I was dating the, you know, I was 18 years old. I was dating the person I ended up marrying her. But um, um, I remember thinking, I hope she doesn't get it. <laughs> I'll feel really unspiritual if she gets it. So, you know, very godly attitude, right? So I don't want to feel inferior. So, uh, by the way, she didn't. It didn't happen. So. My prayers were answered. Anyway, I don't know if that was a prayer. But 11, uh, me measuring spirituality by experience, by, by, by tongue speaking, or by, uh, by holy laughter, or by slaying in the spirit. And once again, the centrality of love can be slighted. Unusual experiences can be seen as the summit of uh, spirituality. So, I just think those are helpful, you know. I think Packer's such a careful thinker. I, 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 found, I hope you found that helpful. So, here's some questions about the gifts of the Spirit that I hope to answer as we think about these things. What do we mean by spiritual gifts? And how do we define the individual gifts? So, I'm going to go really fast for most of these definitions. But what do we mean when we talk about spiritual gifts and how do we define them. Secondly, what is the fundamental purpose of spiritual gifts? What are they for? That's an important question, isn't it? Third, this is a question many people ask, are spiritual gifts natural talents or are they supernatural? Are they natural talents that we have or are they supernaturally given by God? Fourth, are the gifts, we, when we receive them, are they permanently ours? Are they a permanent possession? Or is it just a temporary manifestation in our lives? Fifth, does everyone have a spiritual gift? Does everyone have a spiritual gift? And, and, and can we have more than one gift? Does everyone have a gift? Are there, are there some Christians who don't have a spiritual gift? And, and can there be more than one? So sixth, are the, are the gifts still for today? That's, I, I think that's my last talk tomorrow. Are the gifts still for today? All, are all the gifts still for today? And seventh, so I'm not necessarily doing these in order. Um, how, do, how do we discover? How do we discover? How do we find out 
what our gifts are. So, uh, let's just, we're just going to jump in tonight. What are some terms for, what's the terminology for gifts? Well, they're called the spiritual gifts, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 1, 14, 1. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 12, Paul says, be zealous for the spirituals. But I think he means by that the spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul says the gifts are a manifestation of the Spirit. So, so you, you, we have these words. They're spiritual. They're from the Spirit. So what does that tell us about these gifts? It tells us these gifts are from God, right? They're, they're from, that's why we call them spiritual gifts. They're from the Holy Spirit. They're, 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 they're a divine work in our lives. So that, that's the first thing. The, the other word is gifts, right? And, and the, word, the word for gifts is charismata in Greek, right? The charismatic movement. Yeah, we see that in 1 Corinthians 12. You don't need to know these verses, but if you have time to write them down, or maybe I wrote them down. But 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 12, 31, Romans 12, 6. You, you know, uh, Paul emphasizes they're from the Spirit, and it's really the same theme, isn't it? They're gifts. They're gifts. In Ephesians 4, 7, he, he describes the gift as, as cauterous, as grace, as a grace given to you. Or in Ephesians 4, 8, he uses a different word. There'll be no quiz on this, but he uses the word domata, which is another word for gifts that is given. So, you know, I'm not saying anything very surprising here, right? I'm just, we're just looking at these words really slowly, spiritual and gifts. They're from the Spirit, and they're gifts. That's, that's not so hard, right? And, and in um, 1 Corinthians 12, 5, Paul says they're ministries or they're services. So they, they, they're designed to help others, right? They serve others, 1 Corinthians 12, 5. Or, or in 1 Corinthians 12, 6, he says they're, they're results or they're effects, they're activities. These gifts make a difference. So I have a little definition here. What are the gifts? It's a very simple definition. They're gifts of grace given by the Spirit. You, you know, there's such an emphasis here on God's work, right? Gifts of grace given by the Spirit. It's all God, right? It's all God designed for the edification, the building up of the church to build up others in in Christ. So um, now I'm going to quickly define a lot of the gifts, okay? Just give quick definitions. So, uh, you know, I have a little chart there, but then I give definitions. The, really, the first one I'm looking at is the hardest one, maybe, when he speaks of a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. So that's a, that, those are very hard to determine. Uh, some people think the word of knowledge is a supernatural understanding of another person's sin or problem or disease. Others think he's talking about prophecy. But I would suggest to you that he's talking about teaching. There's no mention in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 and the word of wisdom and word of knowledge come in 1 Corinthians 12, um, 8. There's no mention in that list of teaching. And we find it as to be a very prominent gift. Paul, every other time Paul talks about the spiritual gifts, he mentions teaching. So I suspect these are two different ways of talking about the gift of teaching. I'm not sure of that. I think this is one of the hardest ones to describe. But in 1 Corinthians 1, we don't have time to look at this, verses 18 through 20, the, uh, the gift of wisdom is linked with the proclamation of the crucified Christ. And, and it, it's a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. And Paul says in some texts, I preach the word of God. I'm not going to give you all the references. The word of faith. 
the word of truth, the word of life, and, and he often emphasizes knowledge. So to, I think that's what these gifts are. I think together they describe the gift of teaching. But that's one of the hardest to define, and I, it's usually not a question that's right at the forefront of people's minds. What about the gift of faith? Well, I, I don't think this is saving faith. All Christians have that, right? So this is a special gift. Perhaps 1 Corinthians 13, 2, it's, Paul speaks of a faith that can move mountains. So a, a faith that has a, a remarkable effects. Uh, James 5, 15 speaks of a prayer of faith that leads to healing. Something, something remarkable happens when there's a prayer of, of faith. Perhaps that passage cast light on what this gift of faith is as well. Healing and miracles, those aren't very hard to understand, right? There, there's some overlap between these gifts. Certainly healing, I think, refers to the healing of the body. We have many examples of this in the New Testament. Jesus did many healings, so did the apostles, didn't they? The, but miracles go beyond healing. I mean, obviously, all healings are miracles, but not all miracles are healings, right? Because you could have the exorcism of demons. That's not really a healing, right? Uh, and we think of Jesus as nature miracles, right, as well. Walking on the water, stilling the storm. So there can be various miracles that are done. Then, then there's the gift of distinguishing of the spirits. That's, that's the ability to distinguish the false from the true, the demonic from the godly. You know, in Acts 16, 16 through 18, you remember this story? Paul, Paul and Silas are walking through Philippi, and there's this woman who's demonically influenced, and she says, these, these I'm paraphrasing, but she says something like, these men are teaching you the way of salvation. Well, hey, what a great advertisement. Paul could have turned around and said, praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for marketing our ministry, right? But instead, he turns around, he gets annoyed with her saying this day after day. He turns around and casts the demon out of her, <laughs> distinguishing the spirit, right? This, is, this, this, this woman probably was trying to get, amalgamate together the Christian gospel Paul was teaching with her, with, with her um, demonic uh, perspective and worldview. Of course, it wasn't just the woman, but those who were influencing her. You know, discernment's a very important gift, isn't it? Not Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, belongs to God. No, on the last day, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do many miracles in your name? He doesn't, he doesn't deny those things, right? But he says, then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. I mean, there's discernment, right? They don't actually belong to God. Does it, notice what he says. He doesn't say they lost their salvation. He says, I never knew you. Even all that time you were prophesying, casting out demons, healing. Judas. Judas did miracles, right? Cast out demons. When, when Jesus said, one of you would betray me, all the heads didn't swivel and look at Judas, right? We knew it. He's the guy. They're like, huh? Which one? Which one? It wasn't clear, right? They didn't know. Dear friends, 1 John 4, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Discern, distinguishing the spirits is important. Then there's, then there's the gift of apostles, right? Strictly speaking, there's a lot of passage about apostles, but strictly speaking, the apostles have to see the resurrected Lord, 
right? And they have to be commissioned by him. That, that's true for Paul. Jesus appeared to Paul, right? He saw him. The resurrected Lord appeared to Paul, and, and Jesus commissioned him to be an apostle. 1 Corinthians 9. Am, this is Paul speaking. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Listen to the next thing he says. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Isn't, isn't that interesting? I'm an apostle. I saw Jesus. When they, when they select the 12th apostle, of course, the requirement in Acts 1 is that they uh, were present during Jesus' earthly ministry. But I don't think that's required for all the apostles. Obviously, that wasn't true of Paul. Paul wasn't around for Jesus' earthly ministry. Sometimes I think the word apostle is used to describe... Um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a lowercase sense, in a non-technical sense, missionaries. So I take it in Romans 16, 7, on Andronicus and Junia, if you know about that couple, Andronicus and Junia, I think, were a missionary couple, and I think they were married, uh, and they functioned as a missionary couple. The gift of helps. The gift, that's, not a hard, that's not a hard gift to understand, right? It's a practice. Practical gifts of all kinds which aid others. It's probably the same gift as the gift of serving in Romans 12. Many, many who are deacons, probably all who are deacons have this gift, right? The gift of helps. This is one of the most useful gifts in the life of the church, right? You know, there's not a lot of controversy about it, but it's extremely useful, no church could operate without a, many people who fill this category. And I, I just want to say at our church, Clifton Baptist, we're just super blessed with so many people who fill these roles. It's, it's lifeblood of the church. Then there's administrators and leaders. Um, we see that in a number of verses, right? That, that same word is used of, of pilots in a boat in, in Acts and Revelation. Uh, Romans 12, 8 speaks of the one who stands before, literally, the leader. Um, and we see this as well in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 1 Timothy 3, 4 and 5, 17. Actually, it's said of elders, right, that elders need to be able to rule well. El elders are to lead. So uh, there's a leadership function to, to elders, uh, and, and that leading is also uh, combined with caring, caring for, for the flock. Then, then the gift of teaching. I mentioned it already, but what is it? it it's the, the, when you teach, you're expounding the word of God, right? You're imparting instruction based on truth that's already revealed. It's not, it's not new revelation like prophecy. A little hint about what I'm going to say about prophecy. It's not new revelation. It's expounding, unfolding, explaining, unpacking the revelation we already have. That's, that's another gift that's required for elders, right? They're to be apt to teach. Paul says they need to be apt to teach and, and to encourage, Titus 1.9, right? To encourage in sound doctrine and, and to be able to explain things clearly enough to refute those who are teaching contrary to sound doctrine. So it's both positive and negative, right? Because there's wrong ideas out there that need to be correct, corrected. And then there's the gift of exhortation. That, the, the, that's pastoral care to the afflicted and distressed. I, I think people who are gifted in counseling have this gift of, uh, of, of the gift of exhortation. But I actually think it's also Good preacher, the best preachers, right? We all are at different levels as preachers. That, but the more one is gifted in teaching and then that's combined with exhortation, that's a powerful preacher, right? And I, I sat under John Piper for 11 years. And John has both, right? He's really gifted at expounding the scripture, but he's a great exhorter too. And that combination is, uh, is an amazing combination, 
And um, of course, every, every pastor, teacher needs that to some extent. G- giving, the gift of giving, that's, that's not hard to understand. <laughs> Uh, you know, that gift of giving is financial. It's more than that, though, isn't it? But it, it includes that. And again, that's just so crucial for the life of a church. The gen, gen, such generosity, such giving. The gift of mercy, practical expressions of mercy, uh, a special gift for those who are hurting. My wife, I wish she could be here, but she's with our 11th grandchild in Washington, D.C., so she's glad she's not. Um, she's having a great time, but she really has this gift. My, uh, you know, we're getting into that age category ourselves now, but my wife is so regularly, um, she, loves, she loves visiting the elderly, and now I tell her, now we're that. <laughs> so we can visit ourselves. Um, so... But she loves going to visit older people, giving them pedicures and manicures, and just visiting with them and helping them. We had an 85-year-old woman who was moving out of her house. I think my wife spent 100 hours or more this spring helping her. And uh, she wasn't grumpy about it. She loves doing it, you know? That, that, a person like that is a gift of mercy, right? That, that's, that's so important. The, uh, the gift of evangelism, the gift of sharing and communicating the faith, uh, church planners and missionaries hopefully have this gift. Um, I heard uh, when I was at Fuller Seminary, Dan, Dan Fuller, uh, you know, Fuller Seminary was started by Charles Fuller, really, and he was an evangelist. He was a radio evangelist. Most people don't remember him anymore. But his son, Dan, taught at Fuller, and when Dan was young, uh, you know, he went and uh, evangelized on camp- in campuses and in the Los Angeles area, and maybe you don't know who this person, the next person is anymore, but the person he went out and evangelized with, his name was Bill Bryant, who started Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now called Crew. And Dan would say, you know, conversion's ultimately of the Lord, isn't it? But Dan would say, he began to recognize, Bill has a gift I don't have. <laughs> you know, we'd come back and we'd share, and it'd be like, hmm. We're very different. You know, Dan had the gift of teaching. He ended up teaching in the seminary. So, quick definitions of gifts. I'm going to talk about prophecy and tongues later, right? Because those are really the most controversial. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, this is going to take me a while, I want to talk about 10 themes. So, you know, so far we've just done donkey work, you know? We've just like definitions and stuff like that. But now, you know, now I'm finally starting my talk and it, the first one's almost over. So, but, so these talks overlap a little bit because I'm going to start my first point because I got a couple minutes. Ten themes relative to the gifts. Here's the first one. The gifts are to be exercised under the lordship of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 3. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware You know that when you were pagans, when you were unbelievers, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No one, you know, another way to put this is no no one can claim to be speaking by the Spirit if they contradict biblical revelation, right? Right? Jesus' curse contradicts biblical revelation. And the fundamental truth of the gospel, amongst others, is Jesus is Lord. So that the lordship of Christ is a criterion by which the gifts are assessed. You know, another way to put this is the gifts aren't a manifestation of our own abilities, but they're intended to communicate the truth, finally, that Jesus, Jesus is Lord ecstatic spiritual experiences, they're wonderful. Experiences are wonderful. I love experiences. I hope you do too. But they're not the center of our faith. They shouldn't be disregarded. More important is our acknowledgement in our lives, not just on our lips, but the way we live, that Jesus is Lord. Because some people, right, they claim amazing experiences, but they don't live under the Lordship of Christ in their everyday lives. 
And, and subjective experience can be used as the measure, right, of our spiritual lives. But Paul brings us back to the baseline of our Christian experience, the lordship of Jesus Christ. So, one, one implication of lordship, and I'll say more about this again, but nowhere, since Jesus is Lord, are the gifts come from him, right? And from God, nowhere does Scripture teach that Christians only have one gift. Since Christ is Lord, he may give a person one gift, two gifts, many gifts. We, we, we should leave that matter open. We recognize that God sovereignly does what he wills. 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 gives us another perspective of what it means to live under the lordship of Christ. Just as each one has received a gift, Peter says, this is 1 Peter 4, verse 10, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's word. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. What it means to use, exercise our gifts under the lordship of Christ, what does Peter say? Is that we use our gifts to serve others. That's, un, that's living under lordship, isn't it? We're using our gifts to strengthen others in the faith. So we're, we're serving under God's lordship when we're faithful in speaking. So that what does Peter say? We communicate the oracles of God. How amazing, isn't it? It's amazing that God uses us, me and you, not just me, right? All of you, he uses us to help others. I think we'd all agree when we're in our right minds, which we're not always, I'm not always in my right mind, but we'd all agree we're happiest in our lives when we are building up others and strengthening others. I mean, that's, that's why we live, finally. P Peter isn't just talking here about giving sermons, right, and the oracles of God. We can all share the oracles of God with one another. Um, I was converted, so I've talked about the person who's my wife. I was converted through the person who became my wife. And, you know, she didn't, like, as I said, I grew up as a Catholic. She didn't start out by telling me the plan of salvation. Sometimes she feels guilty about that. But actually, it worked very well because she would say to me something like this. She'd say to me, you know, I was reading the Bible last night, and it said, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And God convicted me that I'm not doing that. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I've never heard anybody talk like that. <laughs> that was, you know, sharing the oracles of God. But what does Paul Peter say here? We do it from the strength God supplies. Right? We can't finally do it on our own. We're we're conscious, I hope you're conscious, of our great weakness, right? We need, we need God's strength to do this. God, God, God is so gracious, he won't let you feel too much the effectiveness of your gifts. He'll give you just enough to encourage you, but not too much, because he, he wants you, and he wants me, to feel we can't do it. You know, I'm actually nervous about a person who thinks, I'm qualified, I can do it. No, we're not qualified. We need, we need God's strength. We serve under his lordship. That's why this is the criterion, right? We need him, as the hymn says, every hour. And, and, and in this way, God is glorified in everything we do if we serve under the lordship of Jesus.